A young Jim Clark sits inside his father's 1930 Alvis Speed 20 car. It doesn't move. In fact, it never seems to move. From the outside, the Alvis Speed looks like a used family car that will sit idly and slowly rust away while tall weeds grow around its wheels. But on the inside, the car's world is far from stagnant. Like most adolescent boys, Jim Clark's biggest adventures live within his imagination. At this point in his life, he's only ever lived on his family's farm in Scotland. But with his hands wrapped around the Alvis Speed steering wheel, Jim is driving himself through landscapes beyond the farm's grassy knolls. Many would love to believe that Jim's playtime in his father's car is what led him to be the remarkable Formula One driver we know today. But the truth is that Jim never had any intentions of becoming a professional driver. What he wanted was to be a shepherd and eventually take over the family farm. Jim was just a kid playing pretend and passing the time. So, how did Jim Clark's unbelievable driving career come to be? Where and how did his natural driving talents get noticed? And in such a loud, colorful sport, how did Jim manage to snag the spotlight with such a quiet, humble persona? Today on Past Gas, we cover the remarkable and record-breaking career that Jim Clark never saw coming. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars. It's not about sports. Welcome back to Past Gas, everybody. A little different of an intro today because joining myself, Nolan Sykes, in the studio is Joe Weber, as always. Oh, what's up, Slug Nation? <laughs> Get slimed. Uh, we also have my two Donut Racing Show co-hosts, auto journalists, and authors of Racing with Rich Energy, the lovely Elizabeth Blackstock and Alanis King. Welcome to pass gas, guys. Hello. You can't see me, but I'm waving. This is so exciting. I'm starting and ending my week with podcasts with y'all. It's pretty great. We're so happy to have you on our tiny little show. Yes, James is out sick this week. So uh, we thought that to cover such an insanely legendary driver such as Jim Clark, we would bring in our Formula One experts to help us tell this story. It's been a busy week. This is going to be a little bit different because normally it's like me and James, like, I don't know, he probably, uh, you know, likes to play tennis. And you guys are like probably going to have so many little anecdotes about Jim Clark that we yeah. would never be able to fill in. You're speaking so highly of us. Um, Elizabeth is the Jim Clark expert. She was so excited when she found out we were doing this. She was like, I know everything about Jim Clark. She was just reading it. She was like, yeah, I know all of this. And she was adding. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I got my I got my anecdotes. I'm ready. I'm ready to roll. Just got that magazine full of anecdotes. Yep. Yeah, we've never locked and loaded anything before. <laughs> <laughs> let's not let's not sell ourselves short here, Joe. OK, yeah. So I'm really excited for this episode. This has been one that's been requested a lot over the years. I think one a subject I've definitely want to cover for a while. I think I first learned of Jim Clark uh, playing Assetto Corsa. You can drive his. Um, Lotus 49 race car, the green and yellow one. And if you beat Jim Clark's time at the classic 1966 Monza course, you unlock an achievement. Did you unlock um, the achievement, Nolan? Hell no. That thing's so hard to drive. <laughs> that thing is like, that, that's the most, I think the most difficult car to drive fast on a set of course. Uh, at least it used to be anyway, back in the day. How far off uh, of his time were you, Nolan? Probably like three or four seconds at least. Okay. I mean, that's not the worst. Oh, that's a lot. That's fine. That's pretty bad. The key with that car, you can't drive it like a normal car. You got to slide it around every corner, mm -hmm. right? That's basically how Jim was able to drive it so fast. Uh, very difficult. So yeah, uh, this feels really funny because uh, I just saw, we just saw Liz and Alanis earlier this week and over the last weekend, you guys are going to hear this in a couple weeks, but in real life, they were just here in LA. We were recording Donut Racing Show. Then we had a little photo shoot, which in retrospect, I was completely underdressed for. <laughs> Uh, you guys look like you're in a music video and I'm just wearing like a donut shirt and some, and some khakis some, uh, some, uh, some dickies yeah uh, <laughs> no, you, were, you were it went in with the vibe honestly we needed someone to bring the vibe a little bit more down to earth I would like to be alerted next time there's a photo shoot firstly and second I'm gonna buy a, a it was full, on the schedule 
It was on the itinerary. I and have it a lot said, of stuff going on. Cute. <laughs> I, it should have been a Google Calendar invite. That's how I would see it. Uh, but secondly, I've decided that the next photo shoot comes around. I'm going to buy a full, like, Jonathan Davis from Corn. Yes. Uh, <laughs> like, Adidas sweatsuit. No, just wear a button. No, no dude. <laughs> dude. You have to look no. ridiculous. Because if you look you have ridiculous. To, like, I, I got to match Liz and Alanis on this. Uh, I think a, a sweatsuit would have been really, really funny. Let's talk about the illustrious life and career of Scotland's own Jim Clark. As the only boy and the youngest of five children, Jim spent his youth working on his family's sheep farm in the Churnside village of Berkwickshire in Scotland. It was a peaceful place with 1,242 acres and offered Jim a sense of safety and exploration. That's insane. That's a lot of land. I wish I had one acre. <laughs> Jim was a playful and curious kid. His sisters described him as disobedient and cheeky. But outside of getting into normal, childlike trouble, Jim was very loyal to his family and their lifestyle. At the time, he was fully expected to and wanted to carry on the family's business. And his passion for farming led him to the Ednam Young Farmers Club at age 17. That is where he met another young farmer named Ian Scott Watson. But neither Jim nor Scott Watson had any idea what their friendship would blossom into. Foreshadowing, we're going to talk about Scott Watson more. Scott Watson is known as the person responsible for launching Jim's driving career, which eventually culminated in two Formula One championships in 1963 and 1965. But for now, they were just young farmers who got along. Spoiler alert. Whoa. Book ending the story. Tarantino style. Wow. Was it a spoiler that they were farmers? Or? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> we had no idea. Like, this guy just grew up on a farm, but he definitely wasn't a farmer. <laughs> Eventually, Scott Watson branched out from the Young Farmers Club and joined the Berwick and District Motor Club, bringing Jim along with him once he passed his driving test in 1953. Scott Watson sensed that his friend would have a talent for the sport, since he often rode shotgun in Jim's Sunbeam Talbot 90 to Young Farmers Meeting. Scott Watson later described Jim as a brilliant little idiot driving like a boy racer. <laughs> yeah, he was a real dumb driving that car. I feel, <laughs> I feel like this is meant to be a compliment, but if you were to call someone a brilliant little idiot driving like a boy racer today, like, that's just the stereotype of modified Honda Civics. Like... <laughs> I feel like Lando fits into that, though. Lando Norris? Yeah. Interesting. He's a little boy idiot. Fair. Yeah, I can Is see that, that just because he plays video games? Yeah, he's kind of like a... He's cheeky. He wears backwards hats. Okay, okay. So we think he... like <laughs> Those not are the two cri him. three criteria for three being criteria. an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so wears Jim Cox is wearing backward hats? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's doing that often? <laughs> When Jim entered his Sunbeam Talbot in local road rallies, drive skill tests, and hill climb events, he did very well. He knew how to handle the car on different tracks with ease and precision. His driving style and future success would leave a lasting impression on the Berwick and District Motor Club, and they still hold the Jim Clark Rally to commemorate his legacy to this day. Scott Watson had a bit more gumption than his friend, and he had to nudge Jim to take driving seriously. Later, Scott Watson described Jim's talent in the excellent documentary, The Quiet Champion, as he had no realization of his ability. He asked, why is everyone going so slowly? And I said, Jim, it's not that everyone's going slowly. It's that it's you who's going so damn fast. Okay, maybe he is a, a little boy idiot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> why is everybody going so slowly? <laughs> okay, but is this not better than like thinking you're way better at driving and racing than you are? Because I feel like that's a lot of people today. They're like, oh, I'm the best, and they're not. I don't know. It's still kind of assuming you're the best. Is he? You're just assuming everyone is worse. I think it's more endearing. We've got this little farmer guy who's just like, what's going on? Ooh. I'm just imagining yeah. him with like overalls and a straw hat driving a race car around now. <laughs> yeah, that was actually probably the safety standard back then, Nolan. <laughs> yeah. That is why so many people died. Yeah, there's like a Quite uh, literally. sheep's, uh, like an inch of sheep's wool between his, his hair and the <laughs> leather yeah. cap he's wearing. Oh, yeah. Super safe. Well, <laughs> around this same time, Jim was starting to get some heat from his parents about his participation in motorsport. Like many parents, they were afraid of the very real dangers associated with competitive driving. 
Jim struggled with his push and pull as his skills and love of racing grew. He felt loyal to his family and the life he came from, but he couldn't deny his talent. Eventually, Jim began to take driving more seriously and with time, left that simple life on the farm behind him. On June 16th, 1956, 20-year-old Jim entered his very first race, where he drove a DKW Sonder class, or special class, at the Cremon Track in Scotland. The track was on an old airfield perimeter and had a typical circuit structure, but this type of track was completely new for Jim. Most Scottish tracks were flat. On top of this, Jim's DKW lacked the power compared to his competitors' cars. The DKW didn't look like the type of car someone would race in. It was high and narrow, and the engine only had 34 brake horsepower. Jim was outraced beyond belief, only passing one car in all of his laps. His competition included Dougie Duncan in a Jaguar XK120. There was Canadian Bruce Allen in a Jaguar XK140. There's Charlie Davidson in a Triumph TR2 and Jay O'Hare in an MG. Some but, cool names in there. Can you imagine driving a vehicle with 34 brake horsepower? Yeah, I've driven a Miata. <laughs> I think the Cabriolet that we have, the VW Cabriolet, had a, like 41 horsepower or something when nice. they took it to the dyno. Man, that's rough. Yeah. Jim and his DKW eventually headed for the pits with a broken half shaft that landed him in last place. Despite the loss, Jim still had impressive times and was in high spirits. Scott Watson said, quote, Jimmy loved to go to Creamen. We stayed at a bed and breakfast near the village, and there's always a barn dance somewhere in the vicinity. He never wasted any time ferreting out the best looking girl. That is so weird. That I'm ferreting. Awful. <laughs> <laughs> is yeah. that like a thing people said back then? Ferreting? Or is this just an interesting word? Uh, ferreting. That he threw it in there. just seems you know like what? aggressively searching. Like, I think it's probably yeah. hunting because you have dogs that would like hunt uh, mm -hmm. a, a v vermin. Or, uh, yeah, but the ferret is running away. The ferret isn't hunting. So is he I running know. away no, from you got these, these little. You have your little Scottish terriers that you take ferreting. That's what I would guess. Oh. oh. That makes sense. Okay. I, I, Nolan I don't know is I tapping with his that. head. I think, it, no? I think ferreting means you are the ferret and you're squirming around. So he's running away <laughs> from his <laughs> head. Or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> St storing food for the winter. <laughs> well, have you ever held a ferret? It's like always goes up your worm. sleeve. Yeah, they're like little snakes with legs and fur. No, this is not a good visual anymore. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Not, it. Like, it Jim Clark was always out there squirming around. Ferreting, <laughs> <laughs> squirming into people's uh, sleeves. Uh, you know, Jim Clark always trawling for sliz. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay, well, All right. that was awful. <laughs> Sixteen months after Jim's first race. He swapped out his DKW for Scott Watson's 1957 Porsche 1600S in three races in Charterhall, Berwickshire. He finished third, second, and then first and won the BMRC trophy. This one was monumental for Jim's career and proved he deserved a place in the sport. He even beat local garage owner and Border Reavers founder, Jock McBain. Hell of a name. That's Jock. the sickest name ever. No, I think the sickest name ever is Viper. <laughs> well, okay. I can't, I can't argue it, with that. Is it not? I can't argue with that. Anyway, like, this... If you met someone named Viper, you would be like, damn. I think that's the, a sick name. The key word is if, because I've never yeah. met anyone named Viper. <laughs> Listen, I've thought about making my name Viper. Like, hey, I'm Viper. People Viper would be like, King? what? Yeah, oh, that would Viper be pretty King. sick. Okay. Viper okay. King. Let's, let's move along. Jock McBain, <laughs> who was light years more experienced and had more power and money backing him. McBain was impressed by Scott Watson and Clark and set a meeting with the two where he asked Jim if he was, quote, prepared to race a real race car and if Scott Watson can manage a revamped Border Reavers team. They agreed and began searching for the right car, resulting in a Market Brothers D-Type, or better known as the Jaguar D-Type. At age 21... Jim was officially entering the big leagues. Big Jim entering the big leagues. This seems so impressive on like a 50, 70 years ago scale. But today people enter the big leagues at like 18. Yeah. Yeah. But those are like sons of multimillionaires and billionaires. I know. And this guy's a farm. They won man. the dad lottery. Yeah. They won the dad lottery. I still think about when we went to the Fast X trailer premiere and Michelle uh -huh. Rodriguez was like, kids in Europe. 
they're not corn balls. They yeah. start racing <laughs> early. I'm talking 14 years old. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty. pretty funny. Is cornball not something people call corny people? Like, what no, is a cornball? Nothing in this she context? said made sense. They don't start okay. at fourteen. They start at four. Like, and yeah, they start at four. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The new Border Reavers team was an impressive group. Their team name was inspired by the historical 13th to 17th century raiders who resided along the Anglo-Scottish border and raided the entire country's border, basically killing anyone that crossed their paths. The revamped crew team consisted of McBain as the local garage owner, Scott Watson as the secretary, Jim as the main driver, and Alec Calder, who later married one of Jim's sisters, as the second driver. The team worked together to fine-tune their cars, enter races, and organize events so Jim could perfect his natural talent. Besides each member's skills and brains, friendship and close ties are what truly brought them together. Aww. In the Wow. Yeah, that was cute. That was That's cute. That's so cute. In the Jaguar D-Type, Jim set a record at full Sutton Circuit, becoming the first driver to average over 100 miles per hour in a British sports car race. That's nuts. That's hauling ass. A full month later, the team entered their first continental race at spa Francorchamps in Belgium for the 1,000-kilometer race. Jim finished fifth on the demanding circuit while driving their Porsche 1600 Super. McBain was so ecstatic about Jim's win in progress that he decided it was time to get him into a Formula 2 single-seater. Even though Jim had never driven a single-seater car, or driven at Brands Hatch before, he was instantly impressive. Jim was set to test the Border Reavers Lotus Elite prototype and so entered as a Lotus 16 minivan wall contender. Some other pretty notable names are in attendance to test that car as well. Cliff Allison, Innes Ireland, Graham Hill. Of course, Lotus founder Colin Chapman was there too, just in time to change Jim's career trajectory forever. Ooh. What I find really interesting about the description of single seater is like, Pretty much all race cars are single seater unless they're rally cars. We just call it a single seater because it's only fit for one person. The other cars, <laughs> they just take the seats out. It's kind of like stock car and NASCAR. Like it doesn't really have any yeah. meaning anymore, mm -hmm. but we it's still just say it. <laughs> it's weird. It is weird. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Indeed. Hiring for your business can feel harder than winning the Formula One championship, but now I actually look forward to hiring. Why? Because we use Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Something I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place super easy. They got this special little feature called Instant Match. Candidates you invite to apply through Instant Match are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in search, according to US Indeed data. If you're looking to hire, I think Indeed is a great option because Indeed does the hard work for you, okay? Sponsor a job. And boom, Instant Match shows you candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your job description. This is why Indeed is the best hiring platform. It's amazing. Indeed knows that when you're doing everything for your company, you can't afford to overspend on hiring. Visit indeed.com slash past gas to start hiring now. That's right. Just go to indeed.com slash past gas. Indeed.com slash past gas. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. In 1958, at age 22, Jim raced against Colin Chapman in a 10-lap race. Jim later described the experience as a whale of a dice with Colin and admitted, mm. quote, if I had known what I know now, I wouldn't have done half the things I did in that race. <laughs> what does that mean? I know, what is like, all what that are we mean? talking about? <laughs> Jim and Chapman were neck and neck when a back marker spun in front of Jim's car, which let Chapman slip past him and take the win. Jim finished second. Chapman was impressed by Clark's driving skills and asked Jim to join Lotus Formula Junior, something that launched Jim into the next phase of his career. Chapman wanted to finesse the Lotus car and felt Jim was the perfect driver to test it. He offered Jim a job and even stopped his own racing to focus on the mechanics and engineering of the Lotus car. Over time, Jim and Chapman became closest brothers and relied on each other for different needs. Chapman admired the humble and sincere qualities in Jim, Quote, Jim was as impressive as a human being as he was a driver. Chapman understood Jim's feedback, opinions, and requests when few others did. Jim was not as technically minded as Chapman, and he relied on him to translate his concerns with the cars and racing into engineering terms and solutions. Also, Jim Clark was very, very small and light, which if you know Colin Chapman, he, he loves that. He loves small and light. Yeah. That is so true. <laughs> 
<laughs> I actually don't know if Jim was small or light. He was both. He was pretty short. Oh, okay. He was 230 pounds, six foot tall, <laughs> had a size 38 waist. Had, <laughs> I love how had this glasses. Whole time, we're just describing this guy as like he came from a farm and wasn't technically minded at all. And he just drove the cars fast. Like, I don't know. It seems like he's definitely not from that racing background, you know? Sometimes you need just like a stupid guy that's willing to put his life on the wrist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's He's actually what they fast. needed back then. Yeah. Yeah. The two are always standing together, making tweaks on their car with the harmony of a pair of long practice musicians, according to Brendan McAleer of The Drive. Very well put. Chapman often stated that he had, quote, no idea where Jim's speed came from. While Jim said, quote, I don't drive faster. I just concentrate harder. Why is he? Why is he <laughs> southern now? He's from Scotland. Because I started that. Now he's just southern. He's I wearing he overalls with a episode. straw hat. He boy, I love haggis. <laughs> <laughs> Jim's 1959 racing season ended with 19 wins and 11 podiums, but he and Chapman would go on to even greater wins in the years to come. Holy crap! That's a dominant season there. Jim's career was moving in a direction he could have never imagined when he drove his Sunbeam Talbot at local rallies. While he still dreamed of working on the family farm, he made room for a new dream too, driving in Formula One. I like how he's just like, man, these race cars are awesome, and I'm very good at it. But you know what I really want? To be a sheep. farmer. I want to smell sheep all day. Well, <laughs> I just, so I just read the... Um, the limit about the 1961 Grand Prix, and they talk a lot about Wolfgang von Trips, who is like mm -hmm. uh, a royalty. Basically, mm -hmm. he had, he was a count. Uh, his family had a big estate, and after the war, they were just kind of you know all they had was the estate, and they had to use the land to like farm and stuff. And he would go in between Formula One seasons to go like harvest turnips and stuff with his yeah. dad. I thought that was, was really a simpler cool. time. Wolfgang is like the name of all names like that is such a cool name if my name was wolfgang i would be so insufferable like i'm wolfgang wolfgang How viper over here wolfgang viper that would be i would be so insufferable what, what i'm thinking about when i'm reading this is can you imagine like a modern farmer in formula one the reality show would be a combination of drive to survive on netflix and that new show that I keep getting advertisements for during NASCAR races, which is Farmer, Farmer finds a wants wife. a wife. Yeah. Farmer <laughs> wants a wife. Isn't Ross like, Chastain a, a watermelon man? Watermelon is, farmer? But like that's so much more normal for NASCAR than Formula yeah. One. Like watermelon farmer and NASCAR, totally normal. Formula <laughs> One, Farmer wants a wife. That would be interesting. Anyway. <laughs> After winning the Formula Junior Championship, the 23-year-old was promoted to Team Lotus for the latter part of the 1960 Formula One season. Jim competed in a total of six races that season, and even achieved his first ever Formula One podium by placing third at the Portuguese Grand Prix. Jim proved that he was serious competition in the sport, and many people took notice of his success. But not all attention is good attention. Damn, 23 years old and he got a podium. Can you imagine how happy Nico Hulkenberg would be? <laughs> a year into his Formula One career, Jim suffered one of the worst weekends in Formula One. Early on in the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa, driver Chris Bristow fatally crashed his Cooper, and Jim had to swerve to avoid him. Then, a few laps later, Jim's Lotus teammate Alan Stacey died after he was hit in the face by a bird and lost control of his car. What a lame way to get i mean not on his, it's not his fault i'd be pit no. like i i die in that accident i'm in the afterlife and i look up i'm like did a, that was a, bird. a freaking bird just yeah. take me out and the bird is right next to you because yeah. like <laughs> yeah. yeah you died at the same time and you ask yeah. saint peter you're like oh that big that hawk really hurt my head and he's like that was a finch dog yeah that was a, that was a tiny little chickadee well, I mean, you know, racing drivers always talk about how, you know, if they're going to die in action, then they they died doing what they loved. But does that apply when a bird hits you? The bird the that face? Randy Johnson killed with his pitch. He's looking over like, yeah, not so cool, is it? See how that feels. Not so cool, because in later interviews, Jim confessed that this race nearly put him off of racing forever and that he was driving scared stiff pretty much all through the race. Following these tragedies, Jim entered into a race that would haunt him throughout his career. 
During the 1961 Italian Grand Prix at Monza, driver Wolfgang von Tripp's Ferrari failed to see Clark in his blind spot and collided with his Lotus. Von Tripp's car skidded off, rode up an embankment off the track, and struck a fence, killing nine spectators instantly. Jeez. That is a lot. Um, another five would die a short time later. This is said to be one of the most tragic accidents in F1 history. Von Tripp was found thrown from the car, having died from blunt force trauma to his head and from his car landing on him. Clark was devastated. Oh, man, that's a, that's a that's rough, rough This is like the opposite of a fun fact, but Von Tripp's death at Monza meant that his teammate Phil Hill won the championship that year. Phil Hill was the first of two Americans to win a championship. The other was Mario Andretti, who secured his championship after his teammate died in an accident at the Italian Grand Prix. Jeez. Whoa. And yeah. Mario Andretti, yeah. not from present day Italy, but from Croatia. Yes. Huh. Mm. That's a fun fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a fun fact. I also think just Phil Hill. Phil Hill's a pretty good name. Like, it's no Wolfgang, it's no Viper, but it, it rhymes. It makes me think of a guy that's as wide as he is tall. That's so true, actually. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. You got that completely right. So Jim found himself at a fork in the road with his career. With just one Formula One season under his belt, he was seriously considered ugh. with just one Formula One season under his belt, he was seriously considering retiring from the sport. On top of this, the Italian police got involved and blamed Jim for the accident and the deaths because Von Tripps's wheel got caught on Jim's wheel. However, after being questioned by police for three hours, Jim was fully cleared of the accusation. Fellow driver John Surtees has since said the crash was very much a racing incident, and it took more than one thing for it to happen. Jimmy was in the wrong place at the wrong time. So, Why does this sound so much like a modern Formula One investigation? <laughs> there were a lot of uh, crashes, obviously, involving the Ferrari team throughout their, you know, 70 years of racing. But every time it, something this big happened, the Vatican and the Italian government would come out against Ferrari and be like, we're investigating, no more racing. Like they'd try to like shut down Ferrari's race team every time this happened. And I thought that was a really interesting thing in that book, The Limit, that they talked about. Mm -hmm. It's like Enzo would feign empathy and be like, oh, you know, but he was really concerned about his cars more than he uh -huh. was his drivers. Well, you know, Elizabeth yeah. is full of not fun facts about Ferrari drivers dying yeah. in Formula One. Yeesh. That's actually yeah. that's actually it, one of the biggest spots that's taken in her mind. Is <laughs> that. I was gonna say, I, I think about you. I think about them poor drivers a lot. Yeah, she does, and she that's talks why about I, that's it all why I think Ferrari is haunted now. That's why they yeah. can't win a goddamn race. Yeah, because they're haunted, they're haunted. By haunted. The, the dead drivers. Yeah. Ugh. Well, Jim retreated to his family's farm for some peace, but reporters followed him there to try to document anything they could. F1 driver and friend John Whitmore said Jim would suppress his emotions and didn't like to express them publicly. Then the emotions would build up and burst out excessively. He would get quite frustrated with journalists. Throughout Jim's career, the farm became his escape from the media. But you know, what's crazy is the most dangerous eras of motorsports happened when people were not talking through their emotions or getting therapy or anything like that. Like this was a rough time. Despite Jim's misgivings about continuing in Formula One though, Chapman persuaded him to stay in the game as Lotus's star driver. In 1962, Team Lotus introduced the revolutionary Lotus 25. This car was powered by a Climax V8 engine and it was the first in F1 history to have an aluminum alloy monocoque chassis. It was also extremely fast, though often unreliable. Chapman was so good at, like, he was a genius when it came to developing these super fast cars, and they were always technically innovative, but there was no way you could actually test them until you took them out on the track, so that's why there were all of these, like, hot messes. You'll hear <laughs> this a lot in, in all of F1 history, but especially with Colin Chapman. Every time he had a car, everyone hated it. It was always bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, specifically the Lotus 88. Elizabeth and I did a lot of research on the Lotus 88, which was a revolutionary car because at the time, Formula One was grand was banning ground effect. Ground effect basically glues the cars to the ground, makes them really fast. Formula One, they instituted a minimum ride height and basically said, Look, your cars have to be this far off the ground. So Colin Chapman, the Lotus 88, it was like a double chassis car. So when it was on pit road, still, 
it met the minimum ride height. Whoa. And then when it would go out on track, the aerodynamics would push that chassis down, glue it to the ground, and just completely reinstate the ground effect that Formula One tried to ban. That's really interesting. And you got the yeah. stewards like, hey, what the heck? Yeah, <laughs> so they initially, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, they initially approved the car to race. It was good to go. Got the seal of approval, and you can still see it on the car. The little stamp that says good to race is on there. <laughs> and then they evaluated it again right before the race, and they said, no, you can't race this. Oh, uh, BS. Yeah. Regardless of the car's fickle nature, Jim's success that year was proof of his true ability to drive any car he was sitting in. With the Lotus 25, he blew the 1962 Formula 1 season out of the water. On top of winning three Grand Prix, the Belgian, British, and French, he also finished second in the championship to Graham Hill, a title he only lost by nine seconds. Jim's fame was growing on an international level. He was gaining a large fan base who not only admired him for his driving skills, but loved his humor and humble, quiet nature. Fellow drivers loved and respected him too. Quote, when he showed up, he was outstanding, said Parnelli Jones. Quote, he showed us the way. He did not get upset about losses, and if he was upset, he didn't show it. He was perfect when it came to being a gentleman. He never lost his cool about anything. Because he was bottling it up. Yeah. He takes it out on his turnips at his farm. He goes and yells at the sheep. Yeah. <laughs> get back in the fence! Yeah. <laughs> then came 1963. To give you an idea of how dominant Jim was that season, we'll talk about the Belgian Grand Prix. Jim started eighth on the grid but passed all the cars in front of him, including early race leader Graham Hill. 17 rainy laps in, Jim had lapped the entire field except Bruce McLaren. In the end, Jim finished almost five minutes ahead of all other drivers. Good for him. This is why I love the arguments that people make nowadays that racing used to be so much more entertaining back in the day. You used to have stuff like this, like mm -hmm. a five minute gap to the lead. We thought like 40 seconds was bad. Try five minutes. <laughs> Jim set one record after another in 1963. He won seven out of 10 Grand Prix, a record that was not broken until Ayrton Senna won eight races in 1988. By the end of the season, Jim became the youngest driver ever to be crowned world champion at age 27. Or he's over the hill now. <laughs> Can you imagine having a formula one season with 10 races and we're like in the mid 20s now be hard to do a podcast that's for sure make sure you check out donut racing show it's our podcast with me alanis and liz and we talk formula one every week baby we're going weekly this year it's been a lot of that fun. is so exciting wow i get to see all his faces every week Unfortunately, though, 1964 was a troublesome year for the Lotus team, as a series of car failures took them out of contention for the championship, though Jim finished third in the Drivers' Championship, as did Lotus. But Lotus worked to fix the Lotus 33's issues, and with Jim's help, quickly turned things around in 1965. By the end of the season, Jim had won six out of nine races and his second Formula One championship title. If Jim wasn't considered unstoppable then, he would be soon thereafter. At the 1965 Indianapolis 500, Jim led 190 of the 200 laps in his Lotus 38, racing at the then record average speed of over 150 miles per hour. Wow, wow. He became the first non-American in almost half a century to win the Indy 500 as he beat Parnelli Jones and Mario Andretti. The Lotus 38 also broke a record. It was the first rear-engine car to win the Indianapolis 500. That actually forced the hand of everyone in American open wheel racing. They were all racing front-engine roadsters at that time. This was the race, the single race that made everyone decide that they needed to switch to rear-engine cars. Whoa. Mm. Hmm. Thank you, Colin Chapman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Colin Chapman. 1965 was a racing season still considered by many to be the greatest season ever by any driver in the history of motorsport. And to this day, Jim still remains as the only driver to win a Formula One World Championship and Indy 500 title in the same year. I feel like if we got Max on some iRacing ovals at Indy, I think he could do it too. Yes, but also he can't unless he skips the Monaco Grand Prix because the yeah, big Yeah, but if day he wins ra 19 races out of 24, I'm sure he doesn't need it. But I don't believe that Christian Horner, our guy, would ever let Max skip Monaco because Monaco is such a big race for Formula One because in racing, 
Monaco, the Indy 500, and the Coca-Cola 600 always happen on the same day. I agree with Liz. They'll have the title wrapped up by Monaco. <laughs> yeah, by race seven. Yeah. <laughs> Just go. But drivers have done the Indy 500 and the Coke 600 on the same day That's because insane. you can actually fly between them. What? That's insane. Um, yeah, it's, it's doing called the double. doing the double. Doing the double. You do the <laughs> Indy 500 at like noon and then you do the Coke 600 at like 5.30. So oh you get God. out of your Indy 500 car, get on the plane and you fly to Charlotte. You get put an off IV in your arm on the, the flight. Car. Eat some yeah. cliff bars <laughs> and get I in that race car. Miles doing the double. Oh my God. After his Indy 500 win, Jim's international fame grew. This wasn't a good thing for him as the quiet Scott began to dread press conferences and was often visibly uncomfortable when he had to make public appearances. His long term girlfriend, Sally Swart, described the press as very difficult for him and said that he was still very shy. She said, quote, It was a different life for him compared to life on the farm. While Jim was admired and liked by his peers, aside from his teammates, no one in the sport really knew him too well. In fact, Graham Hill and Sir Jackie Stewart, who were two very extroverted drivers that Jim consistently raced against, both said that Jim was the exact opposite of them. In the car, Jim was often described as the epitome of calm and controlled aggression, but off the track, he constantly chewed his fingernails and was surprisingly indecisive. Sounds like me. (laughs) (laughs) His girlfriend, Swart, also said that going out to dinner together was frustrating because Jim couldn't even decide which restaurant to go to. His lack of decision-making capabilities is even what eventually led him and Swart to break up. This man would not survive Netflix. No. You know? No, he wouldn't. And also, like, just go to a chain restaurant. I do it all the time. Swart was described as the love of his life, but she explains that they broke up in the end because Jimmy couldn't make up his mind. Damn. Unless you think that this is just the point of view of a jilted ex, Jim was often described by friends as a terrible decision maker. That's sad. I think that in Jackie Stewart's autobiography, I think there's even like a little anecdote about how they were driving and Jim couldn't decide like which fork in the road to take <laughs> or like, did he yeah, not have dis- a map? No, decided at the very last second. Uh, it was either that or it was like a train was coming and they were trying to figure out whether or not to stop. Oh, my God. Like, yeah, just like trying to figure out whether or not to stop. That sounds whether so or not, Yeah, whether or not you can make it. But the thing about sports and particularly racing is it's all about decisions. You see another driver do something and you have to decide, do I commit to this or do I back yeah. off? Maybe like, maybe it's because he had too much time to think about it. Yeah, and it's, it's less like, of a no, that's it's like idea. less of yeah. a decision right. on the track and more of just a reaction. You know, yeah. that's true. Mm-hmm. Jim's success made him extremely wealthy, something that led him to become what they call a tax exile in Paris. There, he would fly a Piper twin Comanche plane that he bought from Colin Chapman and was often seen hanging around with different female companions. Friends said that Paris loosened him up a bit, got him liberated. With his new French citizenship, though, Jim was unable to return to UK soil for a whole year. His sister said that it was, quote, a rough time for him to not be able to come and go as he pleased. Though Jim was never married, he did admit to a girlfriend of his that his goal was to eventually settle down and have a family of his own back on the farm in Scotland. These long-term goals in mind, Jim began to purposely only sign one-year contracts so that he could be free to leave the sport whenever he wanted. I respect that a lot. Good for him. Formula One's 1966 season had a change in regulations that not only affected Jim, but the sport as a whole. At the time, sports cars were capable of outrunning Formula One cars due to their much larger, more powerful engines. So, the FIA increased engine capacity to 3 liters, which was not a smooth transition for many drivers or car makers. Because the Lotus 33 had a 2-liter Coventry Climax engine, the team was far less competitive than in previous seasons. Jim didn't score any points until he drove in the British Grand Prix and took 3rd place in the following race at the Dutch Grand Prix. However, At the 1966 Italian Grand Prix and all races onwards, the team began using the highly complex BRM H16 engines in their Lotus 43 car, which finally gave Jim his only victory that Formula 1 season at the U.S. Grand Prix. He beat Jochen Rindt and John Surtees in the penultimate race. I love that name, Jochen Rindt. It's so sick. That's it. I think... I think any name that starts with a, like a good yeah, yeah. Is, a, is a really good name, like a yeah. Like, it's well, just both intense. Of, both those names sound like you're about to throw up a little bit, but in a cool that, way. That's actually so true. Like, yeah. <laughs> <Don't say laughs> <me. laughs> Listen, it adds a little pizzazz. 
1967, Jim raced in three different Lotus cars with three different engines. Chapman praises his ability to be flexible because, as he put it, Jim was, quote, very easy on the machinery, <laughs> which <laughs> sounds like something nice. like an older man would tell a woman standing next to a car. <laughs> yeah. The Lotus 43, which he had driven to victory in 1966, made its final appearance at the 67 South African Grand Prix after both Jim and his teammate, Graham Hill, had to retire the cars. The team then moved on to build the much more successful and aforementioned Lotus 49, which was developed after Lotus began working with Ford Cosworth. Jim drove it to victory at the Dutch Grand Prix, beating out Jack Brabham and Denny Holm. But unfortunately, his four wins of the season couldn't take away his five retirements, and Jim ended the season in third. Jim did have some success in his third Lotus, the now aging Lotus 38, which he drove to victory at the Australasia Tasman Series, though he placed 31st at Indy in the vehicle. Past Gas by Donut Media is sponsored by BetterHelp. You know, whether the chips are down or you're in a really good place, life experiences changes your perspective on things and makes you think about things that have happened to you in the past a little differently. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially since we're always growing and changing. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding, because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. It's helpful to learn positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. Therapy isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma. Even if you're just going through your day to day and need a little helping hand, therapy and BetterHelp is there for you. I think BetterHelp is a great option for anybody looking to get into therapy to get the help they need. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash past gas today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash past gas. Thank you, BetterHelp. Sadly, the 1968 season would be Jim's last. His year began with his third win at the Australasia Tasman Series Championship race, and during his time there, he stayed with Australian driver Leo Gagan and his family in Sydney. In The Quiet Champion, Gagan recounts a funny story where Jim arrived for his stay when no one was home but Gagan's mother. She didn't know who Jim was and assumed he was there to mow their lawn. This poor guy, like everybody <laughs> just thinks like he's just like this down south. He looks like a farmer. Redneck farmer guy. And they're just like, he's here to mow the lawn. Like, mm -hmm. no, he's a Formula One champion. Anyway, she naturally told him that the mower was in the shed and that he could start <laughs> at any time. When Gagan, his dad and his brother returned home, they were surprised to find Jim shirtless and mowing the front lawn. <laughs> like, that's just like someone who wants to avoid conflict like yeah <laughs> he doesn't want to have a conversation about it so if you tell him to mow the lawn he's just going to <laughs> unfortunately just over a month later jim was racing a lotus 48 gold leaf in a formula 2 race at the hockenheim ring when his car left the track at 150 miles per hour jim did not survive the accident was a shock to everyone Formula One drivers from around the world flew to Scotland's Churnside Parish Church to pay their respects at Jim's funeral, alongside his family and friends. Chapman said he lost his best friend, and Graham Hill said what he would miss most was Jim Clark's smile. Drivers like Surtees and Brabham were adamant that his crash was not due to driver error, and they didn't believe that Jim was capable of making a life-threatening mistake. Driver Chris Amon said if it could happen to him, what chance do the rest of us have? The crash was investigated for three weeks by aircraft crash investigators, and eventually the team concluded that the reason for the crash was a tire failure. Dang, that sucks. I think the thing that makes me the saddest about this was that uh, back in the day, drivers, because there were only 10 to 12 Formula One races, drivers filled the gaps with things like Formula Two and the Tasman series. This race that Jim was racing at was a contractual obligation by Firestone, his tire manufacturer. Oh. He had, yeah, he had to pick uh. between this race and a thousand kilometer race in Brands Hatch. And he chose the t Formula Two race because it was more relevant to his Formula One career and because the entry list was incredible. Like Derek Bell, Pierce Courage, Graham Hill, Clay Rigazzoni, like all of the big names were already competing. So why not Jim Clark? Um, and his tire failed and 
That was it. And what's really interesting is that today, these racing schedules are generally so long and team owners are so, they're so protective of drivers that often drivers don't get to race in a lot of other Mm -hmm. series these days. So it was completely the opposite back then. People were racing all over the place. These days, team owners are like, no, you're going to race in my series because if you get hurt, that impacts sponsors, that impacts Mm -hmm. everything, that impacts the bottom Mm -hmm. line. And, you know, it's less likely for something like that to happen today. Not like it's not completely unlikely. It's just less likely because things are more strict. There's an MLB pitcher that had to secretly, um, he was like a Bronco rider and Mm. he just had signed like a $400 million contract for over 10 years and was banned from doing anything, you know, like riding Mm -hmm. ATVs. He's like a country boy. But then they found out uh, that he was riding bulls and bucking broncos like under this Bro. pseudonym and they're like you gotta stop doing that your hands are your life man <laughs> good lord <laughs> i mean honestly though if you're that rich anyway like i get that he has contractual obligations but if you yeah. have that much money anyway do whatever you want, whatever you want. like if your career ends, you still have money. It doesn't That's true. matter. Because on the other hand, there's a guy who a pitcher who is about to pitch in the World Series and couldn't because he was messing around with a drone and he cut his hand. <laughs> mm. Oh my god. That's embarrassing. To this day, there is a memorial for Jim at the Hockenheim track, and a Jim Clark Memorial Award is given out annually by the Association of Scottish Motoring Riders. And of course, many gather for the Jim Clark rally held in Berwickshire every year. Jim Clark's death actually really changed the way that team owners and team principals related to their drivers. Um, This was the incident that made everyone kind of back up and take a step away and say, we're not going to be friends anymore. We're going to be business associates. Uh, And this was especially important because Colin Chapman and Jim Clark were such good buddies. Um, Colin Chapman actually like became a after that to all of his drivers. Um, And Yuck and Rint was especially known for butting heads with Colin Chapman. And he was the one who replaced Jim Clark. I find this really interesting because like, okay, we're not going to have a relationship because we're business associates. But also the reason we're not having a relationship is because in this business that I am paying you to do, you may die. Mm -hmm. Like that's so morbid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. During his time in Formula One, Jim achieved 33 pole positions and won 25 of the 72 Grand Prix he took part in. This win record gives him a 34.7% win rate and is one of the top five most winningest Formula One drivers of all time, if we go by win rate. He won the Drivers' Championship twice and was crucial to the success of the Lotus team. Jim was known to adapt to any car he was driving, or as Sir Jackie Stewart put it, quote, he was so smooth, so clean, he drove with such finesse, he never bullied a race car. He sort of caressed it into doing things he wanted it to do. He really ferreted those race cars. I was, I was just about say. to say ferret. <laughs> We're going back to yeah. ferrets. Yeah, they uh, are smooth. Uh. In 1990, Jim was inducted into the International Motorsports Hall of Fame. And just last year, he became an inaugural inductee into the Scottish Sports Hall of Fame. Jim is a forever beloved driver in F1 history and will always be remembered for his quiet magic at the track. So there you mm. have it. The story of Jim Clark... Uh, looking at some pictures of him right now. Handsome guy. Handsome, he is a I was handsome say, guy. He looks like uh, he could have played Bond at some point. Mm. But, you know, I also feel like when we look at people in old imagery and old video, we're looking at them from a different lens because our video cameras and everything like that, they're so high quality th- yeah. these days that you can see every little perfection imperfection on someone. But you look at a Polaroid and you're like, oh, look, all those people oh, look, look so, so good. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> we, should, we should go back to that, I think. Yeah, lo- a low def, low def mm-hmm. revolution. Low def. I'm there with it you. It looks better for all of us. It's so much better for all of us. Yeah, 360p. <laughs> mm-hmm. Totally agree. <laughs> all right, we've got some fan mail this week. This is from... Uh, Tochi over in Perth, Australia. Whatever happened to the potential human bone that Joe found? Uh, what did ever Joe, happen give to us, that? Give us oh, the full wanna, story oh. here. Uh, so last house that I lived at, I was walking my dog and I saw a weird looking stick uh, sticking out of a, a dirt berm. And I, I pawed at it a little bit and found what was either a hollow bone or a stick. And then I looked at it more and it had 
you know, like the dog bone end to it. And uh-huh. I was like, wait, this mm. actually might be a bone. It was too big for a dog or coyote bone. And then it was, the end was clean cut. So it hadn't broken, hadn't <laughs> mm-hmm. been gnawed at. And so I was like, well, this is messed up. Like what's going on? This is like Dexter. I tried to bring it to three different police precincts. They shooed me out. Uh, oh, and wow. then I tweeted at LA coroner with a picture of the bone and said, Hey, I have this bone. I'd like to give it to you in case there, you know, there's some, something. Someone out awry. there. Missing the bone. Yeah. <laughs> and an, uh, two anthropologists DM me and they were like, this is from an older woman. Looks like she might've had osteoporosis, uh, or been malnu- malnourished or something. And then the, the clean cut didn't sit well with them as well. And so I just kept tweeting at the corner and eventually a squad car pulled up and took my statement and took the bone. And that's the last I heard of it. And wow. I moved and haven't thought about it. Dang. Wow. That's so crazy. That's my stuff. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, yeah. Man. But, but then I did more research into the neighborhood I was in and it was uh, in the early 1900s a big hideout for smugglers and robbers and, oh, and there were a bunch of brothels there uh so it could have been you know 100 years old it was not the clean cut really was scary to me because if it was like yeah but it seemed like an older bone so uh i would love to know the backstory too wow. I, that but yeah. that's all i know about the bone that's crazy man i like how you called the police and the police were like nah i went to i went to three different nah. precincts and they were like threatening me to get out of their uh lobby and i was like what is going on like all i want to do is just like turn why are they not why would they not be interested in a a bone i think they just didn't want to you know they wanted to pass it on to a different jurisdiction Mm -hmm. or something like that Mm -hmm. wow okay they don't like doing paperwork is what i've gleaned yeah wow well tochi has a second part of this question tochi's letter goes on also was nolan's hand enlargement a success (laughs) did his family lay off him at events as a result uh yes to both questions tochi my my hands i got him uh uh just a small 10 percent enlargement no big deal i can still like all, all my functions are still like familiar you know i don't have to like totally adapt to a new hand size and yeah, yeah, people are being nicer to me. So thank you for your concern. If you'd like to hit us up uh, with your own questions, go ahead and uh, email passgas at donomedia.com. We might read them on air. So Joe, thank you for that true crime update. Thank you so much for listening, guys. If you uh, would like to hear more of Alanis and Liz's and mine's voice, go ahead and seek out the Donut Racing Show and follow Alanis on social media at Alanis and King on both Instagram and Twitter on Twitter. Follow Elizabeth at Eliz underscore Blackstock and on Instagram, Eliza Blackstock. Mm-hmm. Follow me at Nolan J Sykes on both platforms. Follow Joe at Joe G Weber. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you next time guys. Thank you so much for being here. Bye. Bye.